and we've got we've got well, to record. Mm. Okay, we've got a we've we we yeah uh, we've I built some um, some uh, portfolios of properties. Then looked at the next stage of management. So founded a letting agency, a state agency to manage the stock, uh, which also brings us deals in as well. Um, so that's quite good. And then we're buying probably one or two a month at the minute. Um, uh, we're buying probably um, in two ways. First way is we're picking up some low hanging stock. So landlords that are selling tenanted property or not yeah. managed to get the AICR done yet. Um, yeah, tell me about or, it. Um, I've read about people like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and or worried about the, the the you know the impending EPC legislation that's coming in. Um, so that's that's pretty much low hanging stock because I'll um, the leader will come in, I'll look at it once, and then it gets purchased and goes into the letting agency. And the second type we're buying is is uh, is planning gain. So buying stuff commercial to resi conversions, or converting larger residential properties into flats. And so between those two things, we kept uh, kept quite busy at the minute. And you, you sell them on like that, Rich, do you? You know, uh, with the no, no. so, it, you know, as a rule, we're keeping them all. So you actually no. doing the work and converting them. Yeah, converting the work and um, we'll buy them on a bridge and yeah. we'll then put them on term finance. Sure. And any kind of buy to let and, um, and let the agency rent them out. Uh, mm. The stock I'm selling are just one or two bits and bobs that we own personally. Yeah, I you know, know what you being, mean, odds and yeah, ends. Yeah. Been caught by uh, clause twenty four. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not you're not really um, uh, by any sort of strategic policy selling. You're ju you're, you're just sort of absolutely uh, not. You're 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 still in acquisition mode, basically. Yeah. Okay, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, selling the odds and ends that you know where you you. You don't want to buy a new kitchen for it, kind of thing, or you don't. Well, uh, yeah, one. Well, no, you know, we we chose to take one. I'm 54. We chose to take one out the freezer, um, uh, sell it, um, put a bit of cash aside. The decision making was primarily driven by the fact that um, the tenant was starting to become a bit of a pain. Yeah. Um, and um, and it was the type of construction that would probably cost us around uh, 10 or 12k. Sure. Um, to um, you know, spend once it came to yes. achieving an E, uh, sorry, a C rating. Yes. So, um, so, so, yeah. I mean, Rupert, quite happy to get kicked off whenever you're ready about this. Um, yeah, we're just um, uh, keeping the chat going for a minute, Richard, just to sure. let people come into the room because yeah. um, we're we're a, we're a tardy bunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. I mean, it's. Um, but what I was going to say um, to you, Richard, uh, based on what you just said, is there are some in the room who are kind of thinking, you know, I've been spending the last, I don't know, 11 months trying to get off the ground and get my first property, you know, under my belt. Yeah. And they're, they're probably thinking, how, how can you be buying two or two a month and what like that? You know, what's, what, where am I going wrong? They may be thinking. And, uh, you know, but you've got quite a, quite, quite a big machine, haven't you? That, uh, yeah. Uh, well, t the, 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 the straight answer to that question is I'm, I'm yeah. the expert in my own area. So yeah. um, unlike other investors, I don't have a scattergun approach where I buy up and down the country. Um, I buy in a, in a tight geographical area where I can benefit from economies of scale. Uh, if people are selling, they, you know, they'll come to me. Um, got a few tired landlords coming to us. So basically, I'm the go-to person in our area. Okay, and obviously that's taken years to build up, and and it doesn't harm having. Uh, yeah, absolutely. High, so um, high street you know, presence you've got. Or, yeah, and yeah. then spotting stuff that um, you know opportunity in buildings that other people don't see. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so anybody thinking about it, just it's it's easy. You just become an expert in your area. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah, become a legend in the in the next thirty years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. takes thirty years to become an overnight success, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, um, so it's it's a very nice position to be in. Um, yeah. You know, I've worked very hard. Um, you know, anywhere between 15, 20 hours a day. You know, in the past, and um, because those of you that don't know, um, I started by 
um, sourcing the properties, uh, arranging any finance with the bank. This was before the time of buy to let mortgages and, and, and bridges, which became fash uh, fashionable. Um, I would, re I would um, refurbish the property myself so I can, um, I can rewire a house, I can fix central heating, I can plaster, I can do the whole thing. Don't do it now because I'm too old and, and, I, and I don't get the time. So having gone through all that, I would then source the tenants, manage the tenancy agreements. And I did that till I got to around 12 to 15 properties and then decided it was time to, um, to, um, to build a business to look after the management of them because it's not something I particularly enjoyed doing. Having looked at all the facets of, of a buy to let landlord and what you could do. And so I'm quite lucky now in that I only do the bits of the sausage machine that I like to do which is sourcing and, uh, and um, uh, getting any planning gain. And sometimes we're dealing with quite small spaces, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be quite creative with those uh, after we've started work on them, much to the amusement of our contractors. And so, uh, so yeah, um, all the kind of day-to-day -day stuff is taken care of by, uh, by my office. Mm. And um, although we've got ten in the room, I've had quite a few messages, Richard, uh, which is why I, I kicked the I hit the record button when you started talking. Um, yeah. So there's a, quite a few people who will want to watch um, this who can't make it tonight, and no doubt yeah. um, a, a number will sort of drift in over the next hour. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it's very good of you to come on and talk to us. What what I I really um, like about um, having Richard talk to us about EPC, and I mentioned this in the email or, or the Facebook post, is that, you know, Richard's not um, an EPC expert. And when you do talk to experts in specific technical fields, you know, you do tend to be blinded by science a little bit. Um, and they do obviously have their somewhat vested opinions um, uh, on, on different matters. Um, and, and not least if you're trying to talk to um, uh, somebody about fire, you know, regulations and what you should be doing in a fire risk assessment or something like that. So Richard's actually, you know, um, uh, gone through already a lot of those conversations with experts and, and come to his own conclusions. And, you know, it, it's very good of you that to come on and actually share the conclusions that you've come to. And I think that the, what's particularly interesting to me is that you've got properties of all different types. And I, I think there's not a one size fits all to, all to this. Um, so just for um, everybody, just as a reminder, it's 31st of December, 2025, that um, we need to be C in order to let a property to a new tenant. And 31st of December, 2028, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that we'd have to do it for existing tenants. Now, of course, what does that mean? Um, it's a bit of a risk for us to go three years with with a con you know a continuous tenant. So really, we ought to be targeting 31st of December 2025, um, with maybe just a little bit of elder spill for the six months after that. That would be a sensible way of looking at it. But what's concerned me particularly, Richard, is that you know I'm currently going through a process where I'm looking at how much would I be prepared to spend per property and expect to spend per property, thinking about maybe a little bit of refinancing in order to get a budget together in order to go through all of my properties. Um, but then at the same time, thinking, are the golf posts going to move? Is funding going to become available? Am I going to be too soon? You know, or am I going to leave it too late where you can't get a builder for love nor money because everybody's um, uh, try, trying to meet the deadline? So I think that I, I suspect that many people have the same, you know, dilemmas and concerns that I have on this. Yeah, absolutely. And so what I'll be able to do tonight is, as you said, I've been we, we start off by asking our EPC assessors and they just looked at us blank. They said. Uh, we, couldn't we can't tell you definitively what to do. There are different types of constructions, et cetera, et cetera. So what we did was with my repairs manager, we went through um, a cross section of all our properties and ours, our properties would be typical of the older stock of buy to let, terrace, mid terrace and semis, because that's where the numbers stack best for buy to let. 
And um, so, so what we'll be talking about tonight is mainly uh, we'll leave out new dwellings because obviously that's all taken care of by building regs and sap counts, etc. Um, what we'll, we'll start to talk about is retrofitting old stock because this seems to be where the challenges lie and where uh, people struggle with it. Um, and um, it, you know, the, the government standard assessment procedure for any energy rate in the dwellings is 199 pages long. So if you, are, if you try and read that, you're not really going to get anything out of it. And if you try and ask an EP assessor, um, you, you know, you get even less recommendations. And um, so what I've been able to do is look at it um, because there's two issues really here. Uh, the first one is cost. And the second one is tenant inconvenience if the property is left. And indeed, if you can, um, I can give you tonight a certain set of um, very, very clear instructions, because, of course, if you are looking to buy property as well, looking to acquire this type of stock, you need to be able to look at it there and then and know instantly uh, or have a very, very good idea of what you need to be able to do with that particular type of instruction in order to, um, to get it to a seat and comply with the law at some point in future. So obviously, as Rupert said, the objective is to reach a C rating um, with the minimum amount of cost and the minimum amount of tenant inconvenience. So the first thing that you need to take into consideration when you're looking at a property is determine whether it's got a cavity or not. Now, you'll find that most and it doesn't matter whether um, it's semi detached, uh, mid terraced, you need to determine whether it's got a cavity. So generally, if you're looking at something that's built in the 70s, ex-local authority stock, anything from the 70s onwards has got a cavity. In it. Um, some of them have got cavities, but they've got no insulation in them. Um, but for the sake of the EPCs currently, we've not, not actually seen an EPC assessor check whether they've got insulation in the cavity. They just put on the EPC cavity, assumed insulated. Whether that will change, I don't know. So the first thing, as it, as if you're going to do a flow diagram, it would be cavity or no cavity. So no cavity would be would um, be a terraced housing stock um, built late 1800s, early 1900s, fairly typical of most of the the um, the Bytelex stock throughout the UK. So then, um, if it's got um, a cavity, then generally you're okay. You'd be able to get it to a C without going to the most costliest of, um, of uh, renovations, which is to insulate the walls, either uh, the outside walls, either insulating them from the outside via insulation, render, scaffolding, et cetera, or to insulate the inside of any outside walls. So on a semi, for example, you've got three outside walls that are open to the, the elements. This is why it would get um, penalised on an, an EPC. Um, an end of terrace would be classed the same as a, um, a semi. Yeah. Still yeah. got three walls to the outside wall. So, um, so we're, but if, we, if we're dealing with mid terraces, so then it is possible to get a mid terraced property up to a C rating without going to the most expensive route of having to insulate the outside walls. What we'd like to do is to avoid that at all costs. So, and, and, and if you go, if you're not entirely sure whether a property's got a cavity or not, just go on to the EPC register, put the postcode in, and you'll be able to see the EPCs for the rest of the street. So this is a great indicator of the type of construction of the property, but also what other people are managing to achieve in that particular street. And if you find one that's a C, you could actually just print off the EPC or download it and maybe just, just copy that. But um, so you need to determine, so if it's a cavity, you're fine, you'll get to a C um, by doing most of the things, which is you go down the EPC is the insulation, the, um, the LED light bulbs, the new boiler, new work boiler, the, um, the thermostat, um, you know, you've got uh, programmers uh, uh, with that, the, um, fully double glazed, low energy. So, so all those uh, eight or nine things that you normally get on an EPC, you can do those um, quite uh, happily with minimum disruption to a tenant, but also 
um, at, um, at a reasonable cost. So if we're then looking at terraced, uh, so we're looking at uh, properties with nine inch brickwork. So then we would split those into mid terraced and end terraced. So I'm not gonna talk about uh, cavity wall properties anymore because they're fairly easy to, to deal with. The most challenging one is the terraced housing stock. Um, so mid terraced, you'll achieve a C rating uh, without, without a huge cost or inconvenience. Uh, and incidentally, when we were looking at um, a C rating on any property to see what it entails, um, there's going to be a cause, uh, they're going to, a lot of problems are going to be caused with regards to cost and hassle on end of terraced and semis, which really doesn't need to be there because if the government would reassess it and make the minimum EPC rating a D or a high D, so kind of if, if, if uh, 69 is a C, if they went 65, then you've got all those measures in all of those types of properties um, which will achieve a D rating without having to go to the massive expense and inconvenience of insulating the outside walls. So from my personal perspective, having done a lot of research on this, if they could make it a D, a 65, that would solve a lot, a lot of problems throughout the UK, where you've got a terraced property down south, which might be worth 250k, or, and, or you've got a terraced property in Hartlepool that might be worth 35, 40k. So that would, if, if they would lower the rating slightly to a D, then that would help immensely. Whether or not um, the, the EPCs and how they are calculated is going to change, that is fact. So it could be that if you've got something that's a D or a high D, that when it's juggled round and recalculated a different way, then mm. it could achieve a C without doing a thing to it. So the name of the game here is knowing what to do when. So we'll come back to, uh, to the, to the mid-terrace. That's not so much of a problem because you've only got um, front and back outside walls. So we're fine with that. The, the most challenging construction to watch out for is the end of terrace and a semi. They're going to cost Can I just you... interrupt you at that point, yeah. Richard, just for a clarification. Yeah. Are, you, are you saying that the mid terrace is less of a problem because there's less walls for you to insulate? Or are you saying that because there's only two outside walls, you, you won't need to insulate them? You'll be able to get up to a sea without actually going that far? That's correct. You won't have to insulate them. You won't have to insulate them. Now, but... I've got plenty of examples of mid terraces where yeah. we've gone in and they've achieved the C. So with three outside walls, that's where the problem are, is yeah, right. the EPC assessor is going to say, look, I can't give you such a high rating because you've got three outside walls and then you've got to be looking at insulating at that. Point. Correct. Yeah, thanks. So, thanks. yeah, so, um, so, so, and then depending, um, so, so if, we, if we've got a number of properties or we're looking to purchase, for example, the ones that are going to show a red flag within your, your portfolio, or within your purchasing uh, strategy, are the end terrace or the semi. So watch out for those. Mm -hmm. um, because at some point, as the EPCs are calculated and as they stand at the minute, you will need to insulate those. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so this, this is interesting, Richard. So what you're saying is it's actually a lot more simple than, than a yeah. lot of us have seen it. I, there's, yeah. You know what I mean? You can almost sort of talk of it in macro terms. Correct. You know me, Sue, I, I only deal in simple. Yeah. I take what's well, very complicated things, and I don't do complicated. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some things can be quite straightforward and quite easy. It's people that make them complicated. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, yeah, so I can. Um, so, so if you can um, see which is at the greatest risk um, of costing you, not only in terms of pounds, but if you can imagine you've got a tenant in there as well, then you know it, you, you realistically you can't take an end terrace or a semi and um, insulate the inside of the walls, okay, without major, major inconvenience to your tenant. You know, and and, and then you come the outside, yeah, yeah, because you have to bring because it, you know, by by the very nature of you having to insulate the walls, reboard them, reskim them, you know, move radiators forward, move sockets forward. It's just that it's a big hassle for a tenant while they're trying to um, to to um, to 
to live in it. It just is virtually impossible. Then you get in onto the realms of, well, if you've got one of those properties in your portfolio, at what point do you do it? Because um, if you are trying to do it at any point when the tenant is there, you, 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 you know, it could be said that if they took it and um, if they were looking to, um, to be quite awkward, they could ask you to pay for alternative accommodation for them and a family um, while you carry out the work and then move them back in. So you've got all the logistics and the cost of that as well, if you're not careful. OK, and um, so. But if you have um, a, if you've got a purchase in mind and it's an enteristic semi, it's vacant possession. And um, my, you know, my, my take on it is at the minute is I would do it now when you purchase it or when it becomes empty. And um, we're the ones that we are purchasing. If we are purchasing something that's enterist or semi and it's empty, uh, it could be in a very lettable um, uh, condition. But we are insulating the inside of the outside walls. We're going through that pain of doing it now, um, because then what we're able to do is to consider that then as part of any refinance. So if we were to look at, for example, a mid terrace, uh, sorry, an end terrace, um, and we were, is in a poor state, uh, we got to refurb it anyway, we would do that. And then we would get our monies back out of that again, assuming you are buying correctly in the first place, we would be able to get the monies that we'd spent on it uh, on the refinance. So we would get on can, that. Can I read into that, Richard, that, um, if tenant inconvenience was not a problem, yeah, then internal insulation would be a preferable route to external yeah, insulation. Yeah, I, I, I would say it's it's the less costly, more inconvenient route. So yes. because 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 generally you'll always be able to get hold of um, you know a plasterer or somebody that can do this for you um, on the inside. You know they're generally um, normally widely available. But if you think about having to insulate the outside walls, the outside of the outside walls, well, then we're into scaffolding, we're into um, the insulation, we're into the fitting of that, you're into the, um, the scratch coat, then you're into the render, um, which is generally costs a lot more, but is far but less. Or moving all the plumbing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, you've got gutters, you've got downpipes, you've got sky aerials, you, you know, um, sky boxes, anything like that. So uh, so while that would be far, uh, might be far less um, inconvenient for the tenant, because you're working on the outside of the property, not the inside, um, it's going to cost you, uh, we found, going to cost you a lot more. And can I assume then that the, the board of the ceiling, um, any gap um, between that and the floorboards above are by default already insulated. And so, yes, because you would have loft insulation if you've got a cold roof, if you've got warm roof, then the insulation would be actually between the joists uh, in the roof, wouldn't it? So, yeah, the fact that you've got that boarding there going, going horizontally, that is in effect an insulating layer anyway. Correct. So you've got so you've got the insulating layer in the loft, and then you've got the the yeah. um, the, uh, the the insulation board that goes up to the yeah. the um, original ceiling. Yeah. Um, it's probably worth noting, Rupert, at this point as well, is that I've heard people say, "Well, um, they they've gone for the cheapest." Um, so we use the eight before Solitex boards, insulation boards, um, and and. What it's worth noting that these will need to be a minimum of 50 mil thick. If 50. you can buy you can buy these Celotex boards at 25 millimeters, but if you do it in that, then you're going, you're wasting your money because it goes down on the EPC as the wall being dry lined, not insulated. And it and it doesn't get you any more points on your EPC. So minimum and the standard is 50 mil. So that takes a fair chunk out of your house, doesn't it? Or um, yeah, all. you would you would think so, um, but um, but we've done a number of houses now, and and you know it, you, when they're done, you can't you can't really tell. You can't, mm. The only way you see, the only places you see it, of course, are on the window reveals. Yeah, and, uh, and you've yeah. got a deeper windowsill. Yeah, mm. yeah. So um, so um, so then um, what you need to uh, be careful of, uh, as well is so. 
Um, so if you if you to draw a flow diagram of this, it's cavity or no cavity. So if it's cavity, you're fine. You won't need to insulate. Have the convenience of insulate. Then you move on. Then you, that leaves you just with um, properties that have got nine inch brickwork. Then you split those into mid terraced, end terraced, or semi. Mid terraced, you haven't got to worry because you can do all the things that are other things that are on the EPC um, to get it to a C. The issues come with the end terraced and the semi. Just going back to the top of that flow chart, when you say don't worry if you've got a cavity, are you yeah. saying that the cavity is sufficient as an insulating layer as it stands, or are you saying that you need to have the cavity filled with insulation? Okay, so one or two things we've come across at the minute, where at the minute, if there's a cavity, they, they'll put it on the EPC and be friendly towards you and put cavity insulation assumed, because at the right. minute, they, they, they got, they, they generally don't, just don't look. Yeah, they got no way of looking. Okay. Um, but that may change. But also, if you think about it, Rupert, why, while I've totally discounted cavity as well, is that cavity wall insulation, if you've got a cavity, if you can get it injected, it's reasonably priced and it's of zero inconvenience to the tenant. Hmm. Yeah. So, so this is why we're not worrying too much about anything with a cavity. All the stuff I've got with a cavity is achieved to see. And it all says cavity, insulation assumed. Right, insulation yeah. assumed. Yeah, yeah. Um, And um, so then, um, so it, it, anything, if you're, so if you're buying anything or if you've got any end terrace or something in your portfolio, take into account when you purchase that you're going to have to at some point um, in the next few years, have to go to the expense of um, insulating the walls one way or the other, as the EP stands at the minute. And um, so if we if we go through what we would do when, so we've gone through, we start with the easiest, going through to the most challenging. So we've looked at what we've got a cavity in, right. So let's get the EPC assessor in those, and let's make sure that they've actually been done right seven or eight years ago, because some of them might not have been, we've come across EPCs that have just not been done properly. So it's worth paying 50 or 60 pounds just to get a new EPC done. If you are suspecting that there's something that's been recorded wrong on the existing EPC, that's, that's, that's well worth noting. So, so um, we, we went through the portfolio, got all C's on all those with a cavity. So we got that sorted. Uh, mid terrace, um, we're going through those and doing those now. We're leaving the end terrace and semis till the last. Um, because we, a we might have that property become vacant, so this is an existing stock. We might have that property become vacant, uh, but if we don't, we are going to leave those till the last because there's a lot of confusion about what they'll actually change about the energy performance certificate. So I think, and the way it's calculated, so I think it's worth waiting. So if so, if let's say we've got 100 properties in one portfolio. Um, we might uh, we might have 30 that's got cavity. We might have 30, 40 that's mid terraced. So the remainder we're quite happy to leave until a the um, the they we know what they're going to uh, how they're going to recalculate EPCs. Uh, but secondly, till there are um, till they may announce some kind of grant scheme. Now, I'm hoping if they announce a grant scheme, they are going to have learned from the debacles of the past, whereby they, the, 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 they were offering grants, but they had to be with um, recognized and regulated and approved tradesmen. Um, and these buggers then started to charge double the cost because they were approved to be able to carry out the work. So I'm hoping that if they do announce um, a, a scheme, a grant scheme, that those two things are just not going to happen. Um, um, but we know that the most, the most, the, the, the properties that are going to cost us the most in terms of inconvenience and cost are the end terrace and semis. So we're quite happy to leave those for now until there's more information. Yeah. Um, but of course, if you're looking to purchase. Um, you, you know, you, you, I, you, you could base it depending on your experience and your buying decisions on only stuff with cavities 
uh, and mid terraced. That that that's that's a sound piece of advice um, for, um, for for purchasing currently. Um, Interesting, isn't it? It looks like the very old end terraces, you know, the ones that tend to, if you're not careful, the end wall comes out. They're yeah. going to be very difficult to sell, aren't they? Yeah. Well, so um, so is the, I, 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 I would say the nearer we get into 2025, mm. um, the, 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 the more this will come to the front, the, the more aware, there'll be more awareness in uh, potential purchasers. Yes. Um, lenders are already asking us at the minute, if we're refinancing stuff, what's the EPC? Um, and, and they're giving us slightly better uh, rates on that. Um, but um, but certainly, um, you can, so so you can from a uh, from a person who's if you're somebody that's already got uh, property, then you could see this as a slight as a, as a massive inconvenience. But mm. conversely, if you're buying, uh, sorry, conversely, um, you know, if, if you're looking to buy, yes. then 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 you know you can take these into consideration. Uh, when you're purchasing, for example, we've purchased, we've agreed to buy uh, another one today. Uh, the landlord um, was going to never got the EPC done. He hasn't got the money to do it. Lump that on top, the fact that it's an end terrace property. Um, yeah. And we explained to them for the impending EPC legislation. Um, all we're doing is stating fact. And all of a sudden, as a purchaser, you've got a buying opportunity. But as yes. the vendor, you're scuppered. You need to act quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, this guy can't, we're buying it with the tenant in as well. This particular landlord can't evict the tenant because he hasn't got an EICR. No. Right. So I've we can't sell it people vacant like possession. that too. Yeah. Yeah. So we can't sell it vacant possession. So you can now start to see where the opportunities are. And not only can you use this as a formula for your existing properties and what to do to plan to go forward, you can yeah. also implement it in a buying strategy as well. Mm. And because we love stuff like this. Yeah. And, uh, today we've agreed to purchase, uh, uh, the open market value is around 130, 135. We, we've, uh, uh, say, agreed at 85,000. Great, so, well done. So, yeah. so we will, uh, we're inheriting a tenant. It's an end terrace, but we know uh, we know exactly what we need to do with the property. And by the time we've done that um, and refinanced it, then we'll have all our money back out of that again as well, um, you know, be, or, for all the cost of the insulation, et cetera. I mean, going back to the end terrace, it's possible, I guess, that you could put the render on the outside on the end wall. Yes. Because you're not going to have too much going. You might have a window, but you're not going to have too much other stuff on the end wall, are you? Yeah, I, I, as always, Sue, the caveat to this as well is the skill set that you have as, as, a, as a property investor, as a landlord, sure. and the available contractors that you've got. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, we, we were able to do this, you know, uh, to go into it in depth for two reasons. One, because we shadowed the EPC assessor, we understand the construction, but we have um, a, a set of uh, contractors that are with us uh, more or less full time. They just move yes. from property to property. Yeah, if it's end terrace, yeah. that land might not be yours. Sorry? If it's end of terrace, that land might not be yours, the end wall. Oh, I hear you. I hear yeah, you. Yeah, but it depends. It's more, more often than not, it is yours. Um, where we see it's not is, for example, if it's from, if it's a size on the main road and they've yeah. got a big billboard on it and they've changed it for an electronic one, you know, the sign companies sometimes uh, um, buy the end wall uh, that the sign goes on and then they lease the rest of the house to you on a 999-year lease. Um, but but I think it's fair to say in general, um, you know... No, that, but that Michael's talking good. about putting four inches on the outside wall. Yeah. You know, hanging the yeah. paint, aren't you? Yeah, well, if it's got if it's got you know um, what we would call an entry, which is a passageway yeah. between the properties, so uh, then then you're quite right. Would that take up too much space, you know, on the entry for you if the both houses did it to be able to walk down? You're taking yeah. 100 mil. You're taking what? You're probably taking 150 mil off what already is a narrow access yes. to the rear of the properties. So can yeah. You, can you 
Give us a bit more detail on the external. Um, I think the internal, I think you're right in saying that, I mean, there may be some more technical advanced stuff we could talk about later, but the external, I think, carries more risk, doesn't it, with um, getting a contractor to do something right? Yeah, and... they're, they're, they, they're fewer and far between. It's generally yeah. more expensive. Um, and, um, and I, you know, if, it, if let's, say, let's say for it, uh, the job costs six grand to do and um, to do the outside walls um then that, that sorry it would cost if it costs 12 grand to do the outside which very often it can do and you're getting a grant for six um you know very often they'll be they'll overcharge on that you know just to, to, to because they can because you you know if you want a grant you've got to go to an approved contractor so mm. to get you know the, the 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 insulation the materials are not as readily available and let's look at it if, if if everybody tries to do it all at one time, I guarantee a lot of uninformed will just go for the outside. So if you try and find contractors, you try and find materials at that point in time to be able to do it, the likelihood is you're going to really going to struggle. Whereas if you switch your focus to insulating the inside, it's going to be a lot easier to get all the materials and labour to be able to do it. So generic materials What, what is the, the standard external insulation how would you describe it and um, it's a bit the same thickness it's it's 50 mil um, yeah. we've not we've we've purposely not done a great deal um with it rupert so that's a question that i wouldn't be able to answer right um yeah. but the other thing uh richard that and, and long prior to all of this you know i heard a few nightmare stories of external insulation where yeah. it actually is causing more yes. uh, damp yes. and humidity problems in the building um, and and obviously if you get water between the original brickwork and the insulation then it can actually yeah. fall off yeah um, i mean if, if you look at it the construction types mid terrace properties were not built for plastic windows as a masses of insulation they're just no. not they're the wrong construction for that Mm. Um, they weren't built for double glazed windows, masses of insulation tucked in the eaves. Um, you know, they, they, it's totally, they were built in a totally different time. Um, however, we, we've got what we've got. Um, so, um, yeah, there's, there's a few nuances to watch out for as well that are worth noting. Um, and that is, um, so, for example, on, on any property, mainly, mainly on a mid-terrace property, so on a mid-terrace, you can scrape a C-rating. But if your tenant has got secondary heating, i.e. they've got some kind of gas fire in the living room, dining room, or electric fire, it's worth noting that secondary heating knocks points off an EPC. So mm -hmm. in practice, you could scrape a, 60, a 70 or a 71, which is a C-rating. But if they have got... Um, uh, gas fire or electric fire that's secondary heating you may lose two or three points for that so you go back into a d so then mm. then so then you go imagine the conversations you're having with your tenant uh with, 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 you know that around the fact that actually mr tenant we can achieve a c rating but we're going to have to remove that uh, get that lovely gas fire that you've got in there or that electric fire that you've just put in or that coal fire that's going to have to come out because yeah. it'll, it'll fetch it back into a D and we're breaking the law. And, and would that extend to, say, portable radiators, electric radiators? Or, yeah. or is, so yeah. anything portable as well is secondary heating? Yeah. Secondary so heating. We, we'd have to tell them to you know, hide away that oil-fired radiator that they got from Argos or something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that needs to be removed when the EPCRC guy goes around. Right. And de depending depending on how uh, what your relationship is with the EPC guy, you're something like an oil fired radiator will be portable. So we could pretend he hasn't seen that. Yeah. Because you know it could be unplugged and taken away. But you see, and, and I think that's a great example of where um, currently the EPC is is quite ill thought out because yeah. you could imagine. The, you know, if you've got an awkward tenant um, and you have to turn around and say, actually, uh, on your property, we received a C rating, but it's now a D because you've got secondary heating in there. Please, you have to remove all the secondary heating. It's just creating um, a conflict where, the, where there's no need to be now. Mm. 
Yeah, that one could argue that um, uh, uh, an air source, air source heater is secondary heating, isn't it? Um, yes. Yeah. Well, the thing is, um, this is this is why um, you know just to, just to touch on, um, it doesn't seem that the government are that interested in energy efficiency. All right. And now, a typical example of that is a combi boiler is ninety eight percent efficient. There is no other form of heating that is as efficient as a gas combi boiler. But they don't, but, but, but you know, you're soon going to get penalized for gas. So I think what you have to look at are the various, to try and understand it, are the various stages of how the government look at it. So they look at, they would look at one, how is that uh, energy source extracted from, 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 the, from, from the earth? Okay. The second one, and is it energy efficient? Secondly, then how is the power generated at the power station stage? And then thirdly, um, what, um, what, what form does it take inside the property? And if you look at those, this is why insulation uh, being uh, currently uh, is favoured by uh, the government, because they'd sooner not use it anyway, any form of heating. You know, it, it's just they'd sooner have, they, they, they're, they're airing towards the side of insulation. So it would appear that energy efficiency <coughs> doesn't really come into it because if, if energy efficiency gas is 98 percent in at the point of it being in your property and being used it's 98 percent efficient and interestingly enough our head gas guy who, who also teaches for gas safe as well has just told me that in europe um, the gas has been reclassified as a greener energy but only at the point of when it, at the power station they now need to look at how that gas is extracted. So that they are looking at it, but you know, so and they've looked at air source heat pumps before, you know, and 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 they they use up just as much energy as a lot of other forms of heating. So it appears that there's still a lot of confusion. They're quite stumped. So as to as to recommend which form of heating you would use. Currently, you get penalised uh, on an EPC for electric heating. Um, yeah, but again, that is going to change. So if you ask me, at the minute, it's a real shit sandwich, which is why mm. we needed to get some clarity straight away. Because, you know, if you've got a lot of property similar to the, um, you know, to the, to the electric, uh, the ICR certs, you know, you can't expect um, large landlords to just get these things done with inside of one or two years. You know, I know people with four or five hundred properties that still haven't got EICRs because their electric just can't get round in time. You know, so um, so it's it really is um, a strange, a strange state of affairs. So um, what we're doing is trying to get a head start um, with the existing portfolio and also helping us to form a strategy for buying. And so and, and, and I would like to see it be a, a D, a high D. For example, on a on a on a on an end terrace or a semi, a high D would involve plenty, you know three or four hundred mil of insulation in the loft. It would involve um, an energy efficient combi boiler with um, thermostatic rads. Um, it would have uh, energy uh, performing light bulb uh, LED uh, low energy LED bulbs in eighty percent, eighty three percent of the outlets. Um, it would have double glazing. Um, and if you've got that, you know, you're pretty much in, in, in a rental property, even in your own property, you're pretty much, um, you know, pretty much you're doing OK at that. You're a high D. And I think, um, you know, that's that, that that high D can be reached on, on all those types of properties that I've just mentioned. So it doesn't matter whether it's cavity and terrace, semi or mid terrace. All those types of properties can reach a high D without going to the the expense and hassle of having to insulate walls. That, mm. that would solve a lot of problems geographically with the stock throughout the country. Whether mm. or not that they will get to that position, and uh, um, I, I have no idea. Um, so, um, and, and there, there are the few other nuances, um, and, uh, which are, are good tips for when you do um, SAPs as well, in that um, you tend to look at different types of um, especially with electric, of heating, um, uh, uh, providing hot water and heating. 
And if you've got any kind of, uh, really the way to look at this is that um, you've not got any stored um, water or stored energy that you're using. So for example, if you've got an electric boiler that stores water, what the SAP calcs and, and what the APC likes is what's called direct heating. So for that, it might be, for electric, it might be an under sink um, uh, heater where it's only operated and is only used when you turn the tap on. So you're actually using the water that's heated as opposed to it heating a large tank of water, like an immersion heater that you don't, that, that, that sits there and is deemed a waste of energy until you actually use it. So you're heating water that you're not using. So, you know, the, the buzzwords like when you're looking to, to, um, to what to install for provide things for heating and hot water, be it be gas or electric, is something that's that um, is direct heating or provides direct hot water, so it doesn't actually store it. Mm. Interesting. Um, so, so that you know, we've worked with the SAP guys as well and uh, on some conversions and had a look to see uh, to see what we could. Uh, and is that why you said that the combi boiler is is better than the um, you know traditional boiler with a tank? Yes. Yeah. So you can you... get that upgraded if if you get a, a, a traditional boiler with a with a yeah. tank. Yeah, so so for example, I've got some so some some flats. Um, the good thing is, if we're thinking about changing something, um, um, we're we're able to test it on our own stock first before. Uh, so I've got some flats that are, that are electric. Did them ten or twelve years ago. So um, the and, and and looking at it from um, a tenant's perspective, we didn't like to use. Um, the, um, the the wall storage heaters uh, they were they were back then they weren't very good and also um, if you think about it if you're doing viewing what a tenant the number one heating form that a tenant would always look for um, especially back then are radiators so um, just bog standard radiators so for example in those flats back then we bought uh, we put amp, amp tech boilers in so A M P T E C H, uh, 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 TEC, AMP, TEC, Ampatec boilers. And they're a very simple um, boiler that's hung on the wall, it's got flow and return, and, and they run off the timer and they would provide um, uh, hot, hot, uh, hot water to the radiators um, to, um, and, and that's a direct form of heating. It's not storing any hot water there that it's previously heated that it's not mm. using. So, so we, we put those in for the heating and then and again for that to provide hot water we just added an, an immersion heater in a water tank but on the epc it liked the uh, it favored the the direct form of heating with the amptec boiler but didn't like the fact that we got an immersion heater in a um, in a in a tank uh, like like nearly all every house had many years ago um uh, because you're heating water in that tank with an immersion heater that you're not always using. It just sees it as a waste. It would sooner you be using something that's that, that's directly, that's not storing any water. Mm -hmm. um, so in the flats, for example, it would be the under sink heaters. They seem, you know, at the minute, they seem to be favoured. However, the caveat to that, again, is that, uh, um, that, that electric forms of heating hot water are all supposed to be reclassified in the new EPCs and to be far more favourable. So um, it, it seems like some sophisticated game, doesn't it? Well, yeah, but you know, it, it, it just, you know, there's an, there's an, an, an ideology, and I had a, um, I, I had a serious discussion with an industry professional who I, um, who I respect immensely for her. Um, views on the on the property market as a whole, but she was talking about this ideological view of energy performance, whereby you should want to do it because um, it's good for your tenants. It will help them pay the bills. Um, you know, it's an investment in your property, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, and and if we're looking using buzzwords. Uh, you know, from the government, like leveling up, for example. Yes. Putting the total cost of all of these measures onto a landlord, I feel, is not leveling it up. I feel it's uh, it's unfair. Um, if 
it, at the biggest level, if we all have a duty to save the planet, do we not? Yes, yes. Then, then how come tenants are exempt from doing their bit? You mm. know, they could be means tested. They could be offered longer term tenancies, for example, um, you know, to be able to contribute. Now, some people would say that they already contribute through the energy bills. But, you know, don't we all? Mm. So, you know. And and everything that's um, that, that's uh, that's come down. And I, my my big fear here is Sue is that they go and make ill informed decisions. They do change things. Uh, they'll, 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 yes. they'll, they'll, my my worry is they'll change the way that they calculate the EPCs, but not understand totally understand what they're yeah. doing or why. Just just, yeah. just coming on to grants, Richard. Um, yeah. Are they still available today? Are you getting grants? No, so so what happened was is if the, the, there's different types of grants. So if we're talking about grants to uh, do outside insulation, so to insulate the outside of the building, um, you know, put scaffolding up, do that, render it. Um, I don't know any of those. They shut those down because they were way oversubscribed and it just wasn't working. Um, there's no grants that I know of to insulate the inside of the building. Um, the grants that are around are... You can get grants for uh, things like if, the, if there's no heating at the property and there's no gas supply, you can get grants to get a gas supply put in and heating. Um, there are grants uh, for people that are in receipt of benefit. Um, if they've got no form of heating whatsoever, then uh, they can get grants to be able to do that work. Um, but those are the only ones that I know of currently. But I will make a comment on those because um, the last round of grants where you were able to get uh, combi boilers fitted, et cetera, we tried it on a couple of properties where we got DS tenants in. Uh, and to be honest with you, the workmanship was that shoddy. They just choose the quickest route from A to B, from yeah. the gas meter to the, to the boiler. And, yeah, and, and the, the work we found was quite shoddy that we just gave it to our own guys for those to do it instead. And have you had any whispers of uh, any grants or maybe more likely um, loans uh, in the future for this? Uh, not as yet, no. I think they're okay. still trying to, uh, to decide at what level that, they, uh, that they're going to do it. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be more likely a, a sort of bounce back type loan, isn't it, than a grant? If, uh, yeah, I'll, 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 yeah, I would have thought so. And, and, yeah. and, 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 and again, we're not holding out a breath for great grants. Yeah. You know, if, 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 we're, if we're holding, if we're thinking about um, two things are going to change, one, the way the EPC is calculated and grants, we, we, the biggest one we're waiting for is, is the change in how they calculate the EPC. Um, the grants we don't hold out much hope for. Um, we, we've even toyed with the idea of setting up uh, as getting getting some of our contractors um, to be um, uh, go through the training to be recommended suppliers to do it on our own stock. Yeah. But that's we'll that we'll we'll look at that when it comes to it. So um, I've just got um, just want to shift the discussion slightly towards you know more technical. Um, um, solutions that, that might be coming in and that will lead us quite nicely on to a bit of a case study that I'd like Chris to tell us about because yeah. uh, and I'd love you to listen in on that Richard because I think yeah, sure. uh, you may have uh, some advice for, for, for him on this but you know we have um, heard about um, uh, um, much thinner um, internal insulation almost like a board and, and, and whether or not you could almost have that manufactured with, with wallpaper already on the outside or a finish on the outside. So you're just literally just slapping it on, you know, cutting it up, slapping it on or whatever. Um, and, and, and the other things that come to mind um, are obviously solar panels and IR heaters. Um, yeah. Do you have any, have you looked into this? Do you have any uh, thoughts and knowledge on those things? So, so, so I do, yeah. And this arena is fast moving. And yeah. so if we take solar panels first, um, I don't, uh, I, I don't pretty much like those. And um, you know, you've got solar panels that fit onto the roof. Um, insulation is a fixed item. Once it's done, it's done. Um, solar panels on a roof. And um, if you need a roof repair or if anything happens with them, 
Um, you know, I, I, with, with technology like this, I'd sooner not be, um, you know, in, in the, um, I'd sooner be a fast follower as opposed to a, an innovator with regards to that. So I would give it a few years yet because we're only kind of getting over um, the, the, um, the, the, the issues of um, selling a property with solar panels on yeah. from a conveyancing point of view. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got from a conveyancing point of view, from a lender's point of view, from a um, from a um, uh, you know from a, 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 a roof point of view. You know, if anything happens with the roof, it all yeah. it, it seems to be a moving part as opposed to a fixed installation for me. That's I think how I'd classify. Yeah. I mean, I've got uh, recently installed solar here, but of course here in, in we have three hundred days of sunshine a year, and um, the. Um, I've got the app that's telling me how, you know, what's being generated. And clearly, when it's sunny, it, it's almost like a perfect um, uh, parabola, a perfect bell curve from about 10 o'clock in the morning till about four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and it's delivering, it's, a, um, it, 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 it's delivering 38 kilowatt hours a day, um, almost constantly. But as soon as a cloud comes over, it drops ever such a lot. And um, yeah. if we've got a cloudy day, it, it really makes a big difference to it, which does make me worry about, you know, the UK's environment uh, situation there. Yeah, um, I, I would soon, I would sooner, if I was forced to go the insulation route as opposed to solar panels. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, by the way, while we're talking about it, what we really should, what, what one thing you should uh, leave well alone as well is, have you seen the spray foam that they can spray in your in your in your um, in your loft? Um, it goes sprays underneath the tiles. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a complete no no from a lender's point of view. Oh, I know, yes, yeah. And it's a complete nightmare from a repairs point of view. Yeah. So you know, we we I live in a big old property, and we don't have any um, roofing felt or tie back or breathable membrane underneath the tiles. So I had a look at it, and uh, and and yeah, it's it's just not good at all. That I wouldn't touch that with a barge pole. To be fair. Mm -hmm. Do the EPC assessors go into the loft? Uh, if they've got reasonable access to, yes. Okay. Yeah. And also, they what have we're talking to, about... don't they? Sorry? They can't, ass they can't assume any loft insulation, otherwise, Rupert. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm well, asking the question. Yeah, yeah I, 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 our guys do. If they, can, yeah. if they can get into the loft. Some of these terraced houses have only got um, a loft hatching where you can fit your, just about fit your head through. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, <laughs> So, so yeah. And I've never good had point. a single EPC tester rock up with a ladder. Yeah, mm. yeah, that's right. Ridiculous. What, what, one good point as well that a lot of people don't realise about when you're dealing with the lofts is I've seen quite a few people put boilers in the combi boilers in the lofts. If mm. you've not got reasonable access um, for a um, for a for a gas guy to be able to get up there, you're invalidating. You've got no warranty on your boiler. Forget it. Yeah. Mm. A lot of people don't realise that. So unless you've got, um, you know, good solid access to that loft area for um, a gas guy to come and get up there and look, or if somebody from the, um, if you want it repairing under warranty, if there's not good safe access, they won't do it, and your warranty is invalid. And and have you come across these thinner boards, the uh, uh, internal yeah. insulation boards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As ever, it needs to be. It needs to be 50 mil thick, otherwise it's just classed as dry line, which is a different process. So it's not to do with its its efficiency, it's, it's to do with the fact that if it's not 50, then they won't class it as decent information, uh, yeah. installation. Yeah, right. yeah. Because, of course, you know, these... I these think I've had a different... Sorry, was that... I think um... I've had a different assessor. This is a Peter here. How's it going? Yeah, I... <laughs> You just said that again. Assessor, uh, the assessor that I have, he says, as long as you have any insulation at all, so uh, 25 mil included, it goes in in his form as the wall being insulated. I don't know if yeah, it's we've any, had, you, you, you've any got different that. in England. We've had three or four assessors who's confirmed all the same thing. So I would, I would, yeah. um, I would thank him. Yeah. Well, you're in uh, well, he's North actually, he's a surveyor. It's a difference, you know. Yeah. No, I think it's all the same body who do the accreditation. Yeah. He's actually, he 
he was very very strict with most of uh, the things for example i've got uh, blocks of apartments with uh, a common hallways and on uh, the walls to the staircase he he put down uh, those were uninsulated as they were uh, as they were leading to an unheated space so i dropped some points simply because of uh, the walls adjacent to the internal um, of common hallway. And he said, uh, 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 the only thing for me to do there is uh, to insulate uh, the internal wall that leads to the common hallway. Yep. Um, and he said uh, the 25 mil uh, would be fine there. Um, just, just at that as well, you were talking about the gas heating being the most efficient at, at uh, um, 98, it's yeah. actually electric is is 100 a percent, but I know where you're coming from. Um, and then uh, the heat pumps are actually more than 100 because they actually go up to 300 a percent, 400 percent efficiency. Mm. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm just with uh, the young boy here, but no. It's very interesting. Richard, would you like to ask your questions and then we'll come on to Chris? Yeah, Richard sorry. Eco, sorry. Come here, Richard's around. Hi, Richard. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah, just a couple of things when you're talking through the internal wall insulation. Have you got an approximate cost per room to do one wall? Uh, oh, 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 oh. And what would it be? So, um, to do one wall, we're probably they would two guys would do it in a day. That includes um, that includes uh, screwing it to the wall, battening it, plasterboarding, and so you're probably looking at about that's about four hundred quid. Right. Okay. Yeah. And do you have to go back to brick, or can you do it on no, top of your plaster? No, no, no. The beauty is you can go on top of anything that's there. Right, so you just batten on top because you need to batten it for external walls for, for potential damp, yeah? Yeah. Uh, you're leaving air gap as well? Um, no, no, you don't need to leave an air gap. You just go, the, the insulation board goes straight to the wall, the batten's on top of that, then you've got wall fixings that go straight through the batten, straight through the insulation, and then that provides a good sound base for the plaster board to be fixed to as well, 12 and a half mil board. And then you need skimming and painting afterwards, do you, on top of that? Yeah, and then, then don't forget if you've got a radiator on that wall or a socket, that might need, um, the socket might need, a cable might need extending out slightly, so you yeah. can um, so you can use a socket again. And, and, and would it have any impact on the window, or is the window intact still and just... No, so the way, so where you would see it on the window is um, is on the reveal. So they just come right up to the the reveal, i.e. the side of the window, and then just um, plasterboard on top of that. Yeah. So so just to clarify now, Richard, you say you do insulation straight to the wall. Yeah. And you put battens on top of that. Yeah. Then you put your plasterboard. Yeah. So you are going to have a you are going to have a, a vertical gap, aren't you? A vertical air gap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, yeah. I thought you meant between the insulation and the wall. No, there's right. no gap there. No, that's okay. Yeah. So, do you need a vapor barrier at that point? Um, generally not. No, depends. Well, that depends on the construction, doesn't it? Upstairs right. you won't. So upstairs certainly not. Yeah. And um, downstairs depends on the the history of the property. Um, right. Yeah. And uh, we've never experienced any problems on that. No, and okay. um, you just um, you just just do that. And that's mm -hmm. seems to be fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've got um, a couple of properties where I've got. Um, I need to make an immediate decision on what we're going to do from an EPC point of view. Yeah, it's quite difficult at the minute. Yeah, um, and insulation seems to be the way to go. What what what, what construction is it? Is it is it cavity or brick wall? <laughs> they're a semi and they're brick with a nine inch solid brick of course okay. yeah yeah is it tenanted <laughs> no just left <laughs> be very tempted to do that at the minute well this is it yeah just do yeah. it anyway because I, I don't think there'll be any kind of change that, that they'll be so drastic to an epc that mm. maybe take a semi um up to a c rating without insulating it 
Right. Yeah. I, I, okay. Yeah. And that's, yeah, obviously the caveat to this is always, you know, some of this technology is fast moving. The electric mm. stuff, the, the solar mm. panels, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, is, is there, um, did I hear a rumour that um, in a few years later, they're going to actually make it B? And if so, should we be looking to get to B or is that just a non-starter at the moment? No, that's a non-starter. That's nonsensical. To, yeah. get, to, get, to get a, a property with nine-inch brickwork, you would have to do everything to get it to a B. Yeah. That's photovoltaic, panels, insulation, the full works. Yeah, okay. Um, right, so uh, Chris um, has been waiting very patiently. Um, so can, would you like to take the stage and uh, tell us about your issue? Well, I'm in a bit of a conundrum, a really frustrating conundrum with their uh, SAP and EPCs. I've gone down rabbit hole after rabbit hole this week. I'm building two new eco houses. Um, they're being built out of uh, an ICF block with a U value, built in insulation and a U value of just 0 0.2. Um, we've got energy efficient, efficient glass, obviously, um, LEDs throughout. <clears throat> um, the infrared heating, the heating system is infrared panels in the roof. Um, they're about 500 watts per room instead of two kilowatts on an electric convention, um, yeah. uh, whatever the normal electric ones are. Um, we've got inductor hobs in the kitchens planned, induction hobs in the kitchens, uh, and the hot water is going to be using a phase change material. So it's hot water on demand using salts that are heated via economy seven um, overnight or economy 10 as it is now um gone through all this these are two years in the planning uh and now i'm being told you're failing the sap um so we can't get a building control sign off can't get tenants in can't refinance them and i said well, what's the way around it and the uh, sap assessor said put a gas line in and a convection uh, combination boiler and it's like mm. no i'm not putting fossilized dinosaurs into my new house mm -hmm. that's not the way it works mate yeah. Um, so, so the thing is, that some of the stuff that you've just suggested may not be reflected um, favorably enough in the SAP calculation. And that's the problem. Infra it's infrared yeah. boys club. Yeah, infrared, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm hearing whispers that are lots of adv advancement in infrared. You mm -hmm. know, heating up the fabric of the building instead of the the air around it. Absolutely you know? correct. It becomes a three hundred and sixty so, radiator. Yeah, and I would, I am not surprised at all that some of the stuff that you suggested doing, such as the way that you eat in your hot water, is not properly reflected in the sap. Because I think it's just very poor timing, um, you know, on, 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 um, on your part in the, you know, I've mentioned earlier that, it's, do you know what, it's great to be an innovator, mm. but I'd sooner be a fast follower. And if mm. I were in your position, my, my priority would be to get it to, um, I don't know what you want to do with the properties. Are you selling them? Are you renting no, them? No, no, I'm keeping them and getting them tenanted. You're keeping them and getting them tenanted? Uh, they'll just be added to the portfolio. Yeah, my, 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 um, you know, you, you, I, you need to look at um, what your priorities are. My priority would be a C and a book. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I can't even I, get to the point of EPC if I can't pass the SAP. No, no. Well, and the other, the other option, instead of gas connection, was, oh, put PV on the roof. And I said, well, that's great, but they point in the wrong direction. Yeah, and one of them, yeah. because they're offset, because yeah. such was planning, uh, one of them yeah. shading the other. Yeah. And so, they said, yeah, but that will tick the box. And I'm not into yeah. ticking boxes for the sake of carbon, because yeah. the carbon manufacturing and transport from Far yeah. East offsets yeah. the life of the carbon saved. Oh, but, yeah. but this is not really about um, anything but a tick box, I'm afraid. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So, so it's great being an innovator. Um, and, and I think your timing is poor because if you were to do, go through this again, maybe in three years' time, more than likely it would fly through. Hmm. Do, do you see, Chris? Yeah. So are there any, are there any solutions that Chris could put in which are not so costly? You know, um, yeah. I mean, for, 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 for me, Chris, um, you know, looking at it from, from a, a rental, um, you know, rental angle is the main thing would be, um, I understand why you don't want to put gas in, but um, what, what, would a, what, what would a protect a potential tenant um, think about all these new measures? Well, I would know? have thought they'd be pretty damn happy. I've got people queuing up for two houses 
the yeah. average bills in those sizes, yeah. I would expect at the moment to be about 160 a month. With this yeah. tech, it's going to be about 40 quid a month. Yeah. So, so you're talking about here. You're talking about something that which is which is um, very new, which I've not come across, which is outside of uh, my skill set. And um, in your your um, in your situation, I would either bite the bullet and say to myself, "I'm ahead of my time here. Maybe in three years it would be fine. For now, I'm going to have to find a, another form of heating to pass the sap." Failing that, it's going to have to be a gas line and gas boiler. So, mm. or or go to somewhere where you think you could get get the answer. It just yeah, that's the other thing, Chris. Situation. Have you um, have you had a second opinion from a different sap assessor? I spoke with three sap assessors, um, and most of them are re uh, referring me to the the updates due next month, which could be two weeks or six weeks, depending on how you interpret that. My other right. disadvantage is that the last sap version says that electricity is mostly coal-fired. Well, in this day and age, we're on green tariffs, but that's not reflected in the database. They can't tick that box yet, but next month they may well be able to. Yeah. But it just seems ludicrous that central government, and I'm not going to say any pol political party, government is setting these net carbons for 2050, but they're not allowing tech and innovation to advance with it. No. I would go in this instance, Chris, if you don't like fossil fuel, gas, etc., cetera, get combi boilers, I would go um, electric mm -hmm. combi or something like that, Chris. Well, do you know what, Richard? I just had a brainwave while you were talking. It's all down to the, innovate, to, to the insulation, right? Yeah. So if I get these houses sap tested without any heating, that ticks a box. Yep. And I'll get um, the first fixed cable input in. But yeah. formally put heating in after. Um, yeah, you can't really do that because your SAP calculations have to reflect what you've actually done on the build in order to get your EPC. So what they do is you, 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 you speak to the SAP guys. Once it's actually built out, you would have to confirm to the SAP guys, this is how I've done it. This is um, as per the SAP calculations. So you risk at that point, um, you know, being fraudulent on your EPC. Well, we're that well insulated. We don't really need heating. The IR is just background heating. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Th th that's a question for your SAP guy to answer, isn't it? So if we get if the IRs are dragging us down because they're rating them as convection heaters, yeah. put the first fixed cable in, in get the yeah. SAP done, fix the heating in after. Yeah. After yeah. you've got building regs and everything. Yeah. And the other question, Chris, have you got any land for, for solar PV? Um, no, not land for solar PV. It's about a tenth no. of an acre in total. Um, there is a little bit of land under, uh, it's probably about the size of eight parking spaces, where I could put vertical ground source in. But to pump it from there to there isn't yeah. cost effective. I've looked at air source. I used to have two air source heaters at my house in America. So inefficient. Mm. They're useless. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Um, I'm a big, big fan of PV, but not on this site. I've got five yeah. kilowatts up there. Mm. You're a few years, a few years ahead of your time, Chris. That's a problem. <laughs> mm. You might, you might only be, you might only be three weeks ahead of your time. But oh, possibly, possibly. But yeah, that was just a brainwave while you were talking. Maybe I'll just do the first fixes, and then put the heating after, so they're not marking us down. It's like, yeah, super insulated. We don't need heating. I'm sure. I'm sure there's um, there's uh, somebody else out there that's managed to do it. I think it's worth um, you know tracking somebody down. Somebody's got to be doing this somewhere, Chris. It's the, the other problem, Richard. I think the thing I'm thinking the same. And uh, you know, I looked at a house that's called the Solar House in Leicestershire for myself at the time, and um, you know, it, it was absolutely you know carbon neutral and all the rest of it, but. And, and I'm sure and a lot of these places are put, built on green uh, greenfield sites because you can get planning permission for these types of houses. And that's why they do it there. But mm -hmm. I, I, I would be surprised if you could find one that doesn't have solar involved in it. Mm. That's, a, that's well, your the, issue. The, the other problem is I've spoken with Herschel, who manufacture the infrareds. Again, infrareds, uh, it's a British company. Um, yeah. the, the Thamino, the, the PCM hot water heater made in Scotland, developed by the University of Edinburgh. It's all local stuff. It's great. Um, and I've spoken with both of them. None of them can help because they're not on the SAP list. 
Now, I'm not yeah. sure if you're aware, Richard, but the SAP list is privately owned and the majority shareholders in that are fossil mm. fuel boiler companies such as Worcester. So they're trying to keep all this new tech off and yeah. it costs uh, high five, low six figures to get a unit on that database. So there's one uh, unit. It's an air source heat pump um, without the ugly box on the outside. It regurgitates the air from the house, which is great. But that's like four times the price as the, the hot water boiler that I want. But that's on the list and that'd get me the sap. Mm -hmm. It's just an old boys club. I have the Herschel panels here, Chris, in my uh, What house. do you think? I've got, I've got some samples here at my house yeah. and I love them. Uh, they're brilliant. I mean, they look really fantastic. They look very plain, but they look really sort of. You're not getting your, your picture printed on it. Um, I haven't. No, we've just got the plain white ones, and they yeah, just that, look that's what great. I they're brilliant. You know, and um, you know, yes, they're big, but they just blend into the wall, and they just look great. They look very sort of what high tech. What makes you mount them on the walls, sir? Uh, um, just ease of, of uh, you know, it's a retrofit. Um, ease of mounting, and also. Um, the uh, I suppose the rooms that I've got them in and the places that I've got them in the room, they, mm -hmm. they tend to kick the heat to where we tend to be in the room. Whereas a ceiling mounted, I probably when we redo the kitchen, I'll probably ceiling mount a couple in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, it, it's actually and it's a lovely sort of feeling of heat when it's a little cold outside them. in the winter. I love them. And, you know, you put them on and then you, suddenly you just, it, it's like sunshine heat just hits you. you mm -hmm. know? Um, and, and although they're, I mean, I think the energy efficiency of them really comes from the fact that you don't leave them on when you're not in the room. Exactly. Exactly. You know? It doesn't need as much energy. And yeah. then you leave them on about a third of the time as well. And, and you know, with your app or the little thermostat, you know, mm -hmm. on, on, the, on the wall there, you just hit it when you leave the room. Like they're you hit amazing. And for the price, I think they're fantastic. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm a fan, but I don't really know exactly how they, um, you know, uh, how they're supporting in terms of the energy usage, or or indeed in EPC terms. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think what I think one thing you so my a couple of people have just brought up about storage heaters. One of the nuances you've got to watch out for in EPCs is you very well may have storage heaters fitted, and you think great or good that'll be great for the EPC. But unless you've got the tariff on the electric meter, the Economy 7 tariff, the cheap tariff, which some meters don't have and can't have, then it's a waste of time. You will just get marked down on the EPC cal. So you need to have the storage heater and the equivalent Economy 7 tariff, the cheap tariff, on the meter. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the other thing with this hot water system. I don't know if you've managed to research it to read about it, Rupert. Basically, it's a big box of sodium acetate, salt flavours. Um, and it charges it through the night on the low tariff, um, 2.8 kilowatts, charges in three hours, a little bit more than a 250 litre immersion, but not much, but at least it's not 12,000 watts. So it's using a quarter of the energy and then it just runs the water through on demand. Mm. It's genius. Yeah. Mm. So is it just the water is just running across hot crystals, basically? Essentially, in heat, yes. In order to heat the water before you get it. Correct. So these crystals, once charged, will stay hot. And I mean, really hot yeah, four or five be. days. So right. essentially, depending on how friendly a sap guy is, yeah. it should be treated as an on-demand heating system. But it still doesn't get me over the line because the IR is pulling me down. Right. And, and how much, you know, how long is the pipework of water that's going over these crystals before it heats the water? I would say it's the size of a normal single level fridge. So I don't yeah. know how many times it goes up, down and round, yeah. but yeah. they reckon it's on demand. Uh, and even the highest room, two stories up and the other side of the house will get it in about 40 seconds. Fantastic. That's really good, isn't it? Mm. That sounds great. As long as it's got the demand to meet a couple of showers and a, and, and a tap all at the same time. Yeah. The one aspect is their second largest and that's 250 liters. So it's comparable to a cylinder storage. What's the company, Chris? Uh, that's Sunamp. Uh, they make it under several brands. Fisher um, also brand their stuff, but the actual manufacturer is Sunamp in Scotland. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll look into that. Yeah, that's good. If you okay. decide, uh, I can probably get a deal. Okay. All right. They've offered me a, a huge, huge discount. Mm -hmm. Very good.
Well, I think I think if you're doing a lot of this build to rent stuff from new in the arena, you, you, with everything that's going off at the minute, it's it, it's, it's it's very exciting. Um, you know, you can build this stuff from scratch and and, and future proof it. And I think, but I do think you've got to be really careful about um, you know which systems you put in. And me personally, I would go for something rock solid at the minute because there's that much up in the air. Richard, I wanted to sort of um, uh, pick your brains a bit on a wider issue uh, with all of this that's going on, because um, I understand that um, uh, housing associations and council-owned houses are exempt from these. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, so in the, in, in the UK, uh, there's historically been two types of housing provider. One uh, is housing association, which used to be the council housing, and then you've got the private rented sector. Um, you know, and believe it or not, a lot of the stuff that have been in has been in the private rented sector for years, um, such as uh, smoke, mains powered smokes and stuff like that, um, are only just coming in in the social housing arena. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, the other thing is, is it's mightily. We're talking about leveling up. This system is mighty, mighty unfair because housing associations are building houses without their own monies. They're getting huge grants. And they're getting huge grants from the EU to um, to improve their existing stock. That's why if you, you can get off and go around the next lo local authority estate and you'll see 70 percent of the houses. Uh, well, you always know which houses have been bought or privately owned and which ones are still council houses, because the ones um, that have been insulated are the ones that are owned by the social housing provider. They've all been done. They've all been paid for by grants, whereas your private landlord's got to find it out of his pocket. It's not what I would call a level playing field in the housing arena. Oh, so it's not the case that, that um, the council houses and the social housing are sort of second class housing because they won't have this. They're all, they are all getting up to... They are all well. getting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, well, that, that's... Um... Do they have to own the houses or lease no. the houses? So, so yeah, the housing association. Um, so we 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 just bought and refurbed one, and we insulated the inside. But it's ex local authority estate, and I would say, as far as I can see, the cul de sac round the corner to the end of the street, I would say fifty percent of the houses have been already been had scaffolding up, insulated, and all done. The the reason I ask is that I've got a good relationship with the local authority. Yeah, and they have asked to rent these out on a five-year lease, paid yeah. up front, which seems too yeah. good to be true. Would that exempt me from SAP? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Don't I'll, know the I'll answer. That I, well I, I would. I well, the thing is, Chris, there are other things that you need to understand um, about what you're about to do. Not least, are there lenders involved? Do you have a lender on that particular property? Uh, I will have. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well then. Generally, um, if it's with a bog standard buy to let lender, they don't like you signing up tenancies any longer than 12 months, certainly no longer than two, two yeah, years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're signing five year leases, that's a commercial activity. You've got to be careful you're not breaching your mortgage terms and conditions. Yeah. So there are things to think about, you see, before you get to that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's your first is your lender, second, yeah. your insurer. They need mm -hmm. to understand you yeah. know, the tenant type as well and the risk, you see. Fair point. Mm -hmm. But 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 with that, um, let, let's talk about HMOs because um, are they in the same exactly the same boat as a, a buy to let? Because I did, did believe that e, it's EPCs for HMOs do they, do they do them per room sometimes? No. So let me. So let, this is a perfect example of where legislation um, in the housing sector doesn't meet up. So you have to um, you have to have an EPC. Sorry, technically for an EP for a HMO, you don't have to have an EPC. Yeah, that's what I thought. You yeah. the bill, okay, you don't have to have one. There's nothing in the Housing Act that says you've got to. All right. However, when if you try to evict a tenant, when you go to court via Section Eight, Section Twenty One, they're going to want the EPC. Hmm. So the legislation is just not joined up there. So for the sake of fifty, sixty quid you would get an EPC. Well, but if it's not the sake of 50, 60 quid, if it's the sake of 10 grand of improvements, would you not leave it and not have an EPC in your HMO? Uh, I, so they, he, herein lies the problem. So if you do as you suggest, 
um, then if you think about playing it through, if you need to evict a tenant legally, either Section 8 route, Section 21 is going to go, so let's say by the Section 8 route, the first thing that the eviction specialist asks for is the EPC. You've got not got an EPC that's a C rated, it's a D rated, you're breaking the law. Hmm. So it, it, you're right. But you're not breaking the law if you don't it's have not an good. Agency. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's very unjoined. So um, I, I take it from that that you're treating an HMO exactly the same as any other property in terms of your strategy here. Correct, yes. Yeah. And um, the other thing is, uh, just following up on what Chris was saying, um, you know, you probably know I've got quite a few properties out with charities on sort of three-year renewable leases. Um, would they be exempt? Um, good question. The answer to that is nobody knows at the minute. I would say that's exempt on the basis that it's a commercial activity. And, and the, the people who you're letting to pay the bills, not the actual tenants. And then also play that scenario through, um, you would, there'd be never any, would never be any need for you to evict the tenants, um, you know, your, 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 your social housing provider or care provider who has the lease, they would be letting those out in turn on license agreements, which they're perfectly able to do. So it wouldn't affect you from eviction. It wouldn't, wouldn't affect you from an evicting a tenant point of view, and I would say it's a commercial activity, which is uh, which probably won't be covered. Mm, interesting, and, and because, uh, but purely because the the provider has the uh, the option or not the option to rent from you on a commercial basis. Yeah, I think that that the word commercial I'm going to use again in a different concept. So I think it's going to end up being a commercial decision because obviously, if they start leaning on me um, to get up to a C, then um, you know I, I think it will be very much in my interest to. Uh, well, they, play ball. The, yeah, the thing is, Rupert, they may um, you know only take on properties that are that or or get into that. They may have a, a policy. You know exactly. that, um, that they'll bring in from a certain date, and they might might ask you to do it. It'd be yeah. great if they could get some grants to help you along the way, though, Rupert, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. So okay, I think, no, very I think I'm I'm going to chip in at this point and be cynical and say I think originally the EPC register was the database gathering for the council tax revaluation. But potentially, potentially, I'm. Um, do you know the thing that only really makes me doubt is that um, we're not that joined up in this country? Does that make sense? No, but yeah. I think it was cynically built that way, Rich, so that the yeah. so that the private sector landlords would pay for the um, the database to be built for the council tax revaluation. Yeah. Note how yeah. the government have taken charge of the register now it's built. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, typical and, that uh, they would do that. Yeah, but HMO and Rupert C3C or whatever they're called, Rupert. Yeah, yeah. Um, are um nothing to do with the council tax revaluation, so they're not interested in them. Right. Yeah. Well, so for HMOs, for example, I've got a couple but of. I'm HMOs. saying they fall outside. You see. Yeah, I've got a couple of HMOs that we rent out room by room, and then I've got two that we rent out to social housing providers. And the yeah. ones that are rented out to social housing providers are not subject to any checks whatsoever by the local authority on an annual basis or whenever. Mm. Yeah, but you see, they're not, you know, they don't need those for the council tax. No, no. Sorry, I'm being cynical, but it's worked yeah. brilliantly, hasn't it? No, they bought the database. They've, you've had to have the government inspector see the inside. Yeah. Well, I, I, they I, I think... Done. Look, I, I, I can answer that question wholeheartedly, and, and I've been saying this for years. What you have to realise is the PRS is very young. I remember when and the PRS in its current form was created when all the buy-to-let lenders sprung up, okay, when they saw it as I a viable investment. You. Yes, I yeah? agree with you. Yeah. So, so the PRS is what? Uh, 20 years old, 22 years old, yeah. which in, yeah. the, in the scheme of things is very young. So 30, what's happened 30 is, years old. 30 yeah, years old. Yeah. It's, it's, instead of being able to have a set of rules in place, the government have a set of rules and guidelines in place, they're kind of um, 
they, the, the, the success of buy to let and the private landowners taking them by surprise. Yes. Um, they're tr having trouble policing it. So I do believe they're, they, I mean, they're making it up as they go along. Yeah, absolutely. But they're also using it for their purposes and the purposes change. Yeah, absolutely. It covered Maggie's um, Maggie's need to sell the council houses she couldn't maintain when it suited her. So she encouraged, you know, there was an encouragement of private landlords to to make up for the lack of council houses. Yeah. So, um, so and we've so served even, our purpose. Yeah. On an even higher level, Sue. So, uh, you know, we've both been at this for a long time. I remember a housing shortage from when I was eight years old. I lived in a council house, okay? Right. And I remember, Thatch is right to buy, someone, yeah. you know, they, they've, done, they, they've, they've done their forward thinking. They've done their due diligence. And I think that any government have realised that when it comes to housing everybody in the UK, that, yeah. bol that horse bolted many years ago. So yeah. what, there was a government, what we're going to do about it? I know, let's devolve responsibility and to housing associations. So then the council housing stock got sold off at half price to housing yeah. associations. So now they're no longer responsible directly, the government, for building them or owning them or maintaining them. That's all yeah. job of the third party. So then the government can come in um, and, it, and, and then start to, um, to police these people as if it's nothing to do with us, nothing to do with us directly, that housing association is not doing what it should be doing, then we'll we'll you know we'll come down on them like a ton of bricks, the electorate, Mr. and Mrs. Voter. So do you see how they're trying to devolve, they're trying to yeah. devolve responsibilities yeah. all the time. And all right, under the uh, illusion that people like that, that the local government knows better for its area what it should be doing. When actual fact, with regards to housing. They were never. They knew they were never ever going to be able to keep up with demand, and they never ever, you know, it's expensive to maintain this housing stock. So yeah, that's it, why they sold them. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, on in the biggest level, housing has been a, a proper, how you know, housing has been a very sore subject for me right from the word go because I've yeah. seen them go sell off all the stock, um, you know, so they don't have to maintain it. They're not responsible for building it now only responsible for policies to put policies and you know and efficiencies in place for other people to be able to build yes. them. So you know housing's just been a total con right from the right from the word go if no, you ask I me. I entirely agree, Rich. It's definitely, you know, that then they've added on extra things like, you know, like this uh, the EPC register, which nominally was to do with European legislation, but you know, and it buys a bit of green cred, but I'm sure it was in order to inspect the stock because they hadn't inspected the stock since it went private, had they? Yeah, that's right. I also think as well, it's not good that people put out there sometimes the amount of money that they're making on, on properties. Some of these property oh, courses... Are, so do I, absolutely. And the people are out there doing it. You, you know what? They might be doing it, and that's fine. I haven't got a problem with that. But if you shove it in the government's face, they're going to need to be seen to be acting. Yeah, and that's what they are doing. Yeah, I don't they know whether you saw it, but we pilloried a bloke on my group who, who bragged about landlords yeah. get rich whilst they sleep, he said. Yeah. And we all attacked him as if he'd, um, you know, yeah. been, been um, yeah. negative about the yeah, queen yeah. or something. Yeah. The, the government want people to they want people in the private rented sector to provide homes and they want you to provide homes for the long term. They don't want you buying a property, refurbing it and putting somebody in it for a couple of years and then going, whoa, look at me. I'm selling it. Look how much money I make. If you do that and, and you put it all on social media, you're a mug. In my, yeah, in and my the dark view. thing is the people who made the money were the council tenants who bought from Maggie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yet that doesn't matter, does it? Over no, here, Rich, if, you, if you're not a resident, so if you, Richard Jones, buy a property over here and sell it in five years' time, the CGT is 100%. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's how other governments deal with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we, had, we, had one, we, we had one portfolio in lockdown made a million and a half quid on one portfolio or without lifting a finger. OK, mm. but but we've owned those properties for a long time. We you know, our our exit is 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 personally is dead. So by the time I go, I'd have been providing 
people, homes for people to live in for 60, 70, 80 years. Mm -hmm. And that the government don't mind that kind of thing. But, uh, but mm -hmm. as for, you know, um, owning property, um, you know, I don't think they even like it as an investment vehicle for your pension. You know, mm -hmm. they can't stop you from buying it, can't I control agree. the market, but they have stopped you from, you, you can't do it in, in, in a, in your, for a pension arrangement, for example. You could mm -hmm. put commercial into a direct, in, directly into a pension, but you can't put residential property directly into a pension fund. Oh, but so I don't know whether that's things, about yeah. the money or about the supply, Rich. I think they yeah. want the poor, the dealer young things who might vote for them to have one, yeah. and they don't want you to hoard them. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. you know, it's it, it's. Um, you know, I think you've got to be really careful. I think you need la landlords is an old, outdated um, term, and I don't like it. You know, it, it, housing provider is a lot um, is a lot better term. It's a lot more, you know, government friendly term. Um, and I think, um, you know, the word landlord should be should be resigned to the history books. Mm. Interesting. What, what an interesting discussion all around, to be honest. That was so, so helpful. Um, anybody else in the room? Well, well, we've got Richard here who asked questions on anything. Um, Richard, I've just got another similar question, if I may. Um, how do you manage internal insulation up the stairs? Uh, da, 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 up the stairs, let me think what we got. Right, so uh, we don't, in, in terrace properties, all hours, the stairs go up the middle of the building. Um, I'm it, can, it can still be done. Right. So, so all, all, all that would happen is, I'm assuming that the, the stair treads and the risers go right to the side of the wall. Mm. All, would, all that would happen is that you would stop it um, on the, uh, the riser. So uh, you've got the, um, the, the, the riser at the edge at the end. Um, you would just stop it there um, and create, um, create like a reveal. Right. So, so, so if that's your wall mm -hmm. um, and then that's your stairs and your tread comes along, the insulation would fit down and then just fit on the top of the timber like that. Right. Oh, okay. Mm. That, that, that would that would that so it, it, it wouldn't really take any space off the stairs. The, the, the biggest priority about that was what would it look like and how would you finish it at the point it, but at the bottom bit where it meets yeah. the stairs. Yeah. yeah, and you'd also have to go underneath the stairs, wouldn't you, and insulate underneath. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If it's on an outside wall, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So fundamentally, yes, you do that wall and yeah, it's a matter of working around the stairs the best you can. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. And of course, you've got your in your EPCs. There's many other things that you can do in there to improve it. Um, you know, before you, you get to uh, to insulation, but that's just the, the insulation is the one that we try and keep away from from a cost and a convenience perspective when we're retrofitting. Yeah. Um, any any other questions on um, on the subject of EPC and energy, and and if not, I might. Well, I've got Richard. Um, just broaden the subject out a bit. So no, I don't think so. Thank you. Yeah. So so Richard, first of all, thanks so much for that. that unbelievably helpful, and I've made loads of notes. So I'm I'm going to take loads away from this. But um, um, obviously, you've you've got your letting agency. Um, some of, some of us in the room are, uh, are not new to inflation, but some are, many are, and, um, and, and some of us had quite a long break from inflation. And uh, what, what, what's, what would you advise? What, 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 what's your thoughts and policies on tenant um, rents and, and how you're you know, dealing with this sort of double whammy, particularly with HMO tenants, of having... You know, huge energy price increases, but also, yeah. you know, we, we've got inflation for, for the money that we're putting in our back pocket at the end of the, you know, once all the costs are done. Yeah. Okay. So, and um, so when it comes to the HMOs, we, um, we we use British Gas commercial. So I wouldn't use British Gas residential because they're not that great. The rates aren't great, but we use British Gas commercial, and we started to sign up to three year rates, not one year. Okay. So. Um, and you, you, you can sign up for one, two or three year deals um, if you want some certainty. Um, when it comes to tenants in general, um, you know, when it comes to rents, uh, you're going to the first thing um, that, you, that happens is, is 
Um, the press sensationalise everything. I will say that. And there's no news travels like bad news. And in a way, sometimes these things can become a self-fulfilling prophecy um, for tenants, for landlords. A, a tenant can believe they're having trouble even when they're not, you know, mm. just because they, they hear it on the news. Um, all, uh, also, um, so if you're dealing with rent rises, you've got to deal little and often. You've got to think that um, when a tenant uh, moved into your property, they were um, assessed on their affordability. So unless, you, you know, if you try and push the rents too much, then, uh, you know, you're just going to tip the affordability over. And, and, and there's a lot to be said for not having churn with regards to tenants in a property. So somebody that's there that pays the rent all the time, pays it on the nose, um, you know, a 20, 25 percent uh, pounds increase, sorry, uh, per month now, um, you know, tenants are never going to like a rent increase. So if you do it little and often, it has as little impact as possible. All right. The other thing I would say about this as well um, is that people spend their money, OK, on what they feel deem it's necessary to, to, to spend it on. You know, it, it's a very uh, emotive subject. You know, you've got some tenants who uh, will moan, you know, will, will, will moan about the rent, will moan about the, the, you know, gas and electric. So they moan about heating, keeping a roof over the head. Yeah, they spend that much on, on, you know, on fags and alcohol and other things. You know, it, they just kind of get their priorities wrong. So, you know, it, it's, not, it's not far from us, it's, be it far from us to, to dictate to tenants what they should spend their money on. But what the first thing I would do is not listen to the press. OK, all this, um, you know, sensationalist stuff about people are going to not be able to afford this, not do that, not do the other. I would just ignore that um, because I think you get I think you're getting information bias there. Uh, second thing, um, get, put your rents up little and often. Um, uh, if you if you leave it for three or four years. For example, our rents were static round here for, for, for quite a few years uh, until two years ago. And then all of a sudden, they've just gone up like 50, 60 percent. Crazy, crazy. Now, the market rate might be 50, 60 percent more than your tenant was paying. But if you try and implement that on them at the minute, you know, you're just going to create uh, quite a bit of animosity between you. Um, a certain about a small churn in a property um, it, with regards to tenants is quite good. So maybe 10% um, a year um, of your tenants, that's good to have a, a churn. I'm, a, I'm in another group um, with a guy called Alan Chilton. Um, they, he, he's a fund manager for the Patricia Group. Uh, we've got £46 billion worth of property under, under management. And, you know, when it gets to that level, you know, we, we talk to them. It's nice to talk to them about how they see things like this. Um, and they would say, well, they like not too much churn because, you know, stability in your tenants, paying your money, paying your rent every month is great. But they, they do like 10 to 15 percent worth of churn um, and, and, and each year. So if they're losing or sorry, if they are got 10 to 15 percent of the tenants moving in and out of the portfolio, when they've moved out, they get a chance then to bring that property, that property's rent up to market rent. So yeah. if you're doing 10% churn a year, over a 10, over a 10 year period, you, you've got a whole new churn of, of tenants. In, right. you? So, so, you know, there's simple, simple uh, things like that, that you could, um, that you could, um, uh, you know, it, it, and, and, and people's ability to pay the rent um, sometimes is not linked to their affordability. You know, when I started out, I had tenants that, that you know, that earned 500 pound a month, but could pay 300 pounds a month rent mm. on the dock. I have tenants that had 50 grand a year and we're always late paying 300 quid a month. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's just a, it's a personal thing. So the main thing would be a little bit of churn is great, little and often with the rents, certainly don't buy into the, um, to the media and what they tell you about affordability going forward. So when you're, when you're advertising um, a property in East Midlands at the moment, you know, is it a norm average uh, amount of uh, respondents at the moment or are the respondents much greater than average how are things developing 
Um, so, you know, it, it, this reverts back to the comments I made earlier. I have never, ever in 30 years known it so bad, um, um, you know, the, the market so bad, if you're a tenant. It is really, really difficult for anybody to find anywhere to live. If you want a one-bed flat, that's fine. There's plenty of flats around. Um, and, and, and indeed, you can see it yourself all over social media, um, Rupert, that um, I don't see many people buying family properties to rent out. They all want H they all want um, service accommodation, HMOs, you know. Yeah. So it's it's really, really bad at the minute. Mm. I've never known it as bad as this. Tenant demand. You know, we, we get in multiple, multiple applications for, uh, for for any rental property that comes up. It's interesting, isn't it? And and you know, I've just converted a an HMO, not for the first time, but um, only one in, 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 the, in the last few months, but I've just converted an HMO into a family home. And I've yeah. got another four on the sort of uh, hot list for, for the future, which I may do as well, you know. Um, yeah, to, yeah. Uh, I mean, and I believe this is a, this is a, a, a picture that's mirrored all around yeah. the UK, to be fair. I don't, I've got contacts all over the UK and I don't, you know, I, I don't, nobody's saying any different. You know, it's it's yeah. really difficult for them. You know, we've got we've got we're buying properties, um, you know, and, um, and, and where we need to do extensive renovations. So I'll give you a typical worst case example at the minute. Um, we've agreed we agreed to buy um, a five bed semi from a landlord. Um, the tenant has been in there for 30 years. Tenant never contacted the landlord in case the, uh, the landlord put the rent up. Landlord had never contacted the tenant in case the, he had to do some repairs to the property. And, you know, so she, we picked it up. She's been renting a five bed semi at £345 per month. OK, and they've not talked to each other to, for 30 years. <laughs> now, who wins out of that? Nobody. Yeah. Because um, so we, we bought the property with the tenant in situ. But impending legislation, because EPC legislation, because it's a semi and because there's been nothing done to the property for 30 years, so you can imagine it's not in a great state, the, the, the amount of money that we need to spend on it, um, you know, not only to, if we were to keep it to a house, um, you know, if we were to, to meet impending um, EPC legislation of a C, there's absolutely no way that she could live there while we do it. And there's absolutely no way that she could move back into it if we kept it as a house and pay the the, the um, you know anywhere near market rent. We could go probably 30, 40 percent below market rate, and she just can't afford it. Mm. Now, you know, so she's she's you know she's she's having to move out. She's not very happy about it, of course. But it's the tough conversation that we've had that mm. the previous landlord wouldn't have with her. And didn't manage it properly. That's you know that's caused a bit of friction between yeah, no, us. It's caused her to to have to find somewhere else to go. But yeah. the law says that beyond 2025, or the law law will soon say because it's not statute yet that yeah. beyond 2025, I cannot let you stay there on a rent of 345 pounds a month. I will be breaking the law. Mm. Mm. So. As, you know, there's a lot of unintended consequences around this. And, yeah. and, and, and I've seen, um, I, and I just can't believe that the, the government, knowing the housing shortage that's been building and building and building over the years, has just brought in, uh, you know, tax. Um, I mean, you, you can legislate it if you want. I really don't mind. If you want me to pass a course so I can be a landlord or do whatever, I really don't mind. You know, but if you start to, um, the way you encourage investment in, in any asset that, you, you know, and you know, Rupert, is to maybe mm. offer some tax breaks for it. And they've yeah. just done exactly the opposite. Mm. Mm. No, it's interesting, and, isn't it? And, and very uh, often these properties, when they get sold, if you look at uh, the hierarchy in this country of how a property is sold, traditionally, the the, only, the 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 most popular way and the only way to sell a property is is vacant possession on the open market. Mm. Now, if a property is sold vacant possession on the open market, more often than not, in many areas, it's going to get bought by a first-time buyer and it's going to be lost to the market for, forever. Mm. 
Mm. You know, um, then if you start to look at, we, we move down the hierarchy, then we can move. To, so you've got uh, vacant possession in good condition, so well. Vacant possession in poor condition needs a refurb. That, that, that in the market, that recognises a different price. Then you move down to a tenanted property in the market. That is then recognised uh, by a, a, a lower price than that, typically 10 to 15% than vacant possession. Then if you go down to a tenanted property with um, with it's not got an EPC or it's not got a gas cert or it's not got um, you know an, an EICR cert, you've lost um, lost all capable uh, always have been able to evict the tenant. You know that fetches another problem, and then you start to see as you move down this hierarchy with all the different scenarios that a property can 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 come to the market. Um, fetches all these different prices and, and we, we're entering the perfect storm now we're, we're here if you buy it you know if you look out for um, things that are wrong like that you can soon you'll be able to pick these properties up at next to nothing at some great discounts you mm. know because you know you, you need to have um, a skill set to be able to deal with these different levels um, uh, you know uh, things that have got you know they've got things wrong with them. So you're seeing it as quite an opportune time at the moment. Absolutely, yeah. We're mm. gearing up to to um, to 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 sweep to swipe, get out, get all these any way that we can. We'll have them. We'll have them. It's interesting that you know whether it's the media or the government, but the the narrative is always about you know the housing crisis, and it it, it, it normally focuses only on home home ownership, which seems to be the political yeah. football, doesn't it? Whereas actually. You know, in the grand scheme of things, if everybody's got a roof over their heads, um, it doesn't really matter whether they're renting or whether they're owning it. Um, yeah. But they do seem to focus very much on the ownership side of things. Yeah. Um, and, and almost blame landlords for, you know, soaking up the, the stock. When, when, of course, you know, that's a little bit crazy because a landlord won't have an empty house. You know, but, but somebody's well, got to live yeah. there. Yeah, you know? we, we, we start... Um, I think that though the, the service accommodation um, might start, I don't know, it's very hard to um, really, really get a figure, you know, to, to all of this, you, you know, particularly if you're involved in service accommodation forums, uh, perhaps it feels a greater thing than, than what it really is. And But I'm just wondering if service accommodation is actually starting to have an impact on, on housing generally. I think it is hugely, Rupert. Yeah. I really do. I, yeah. I, I've said on other forums, I would ban it. Right. Family homes are built for family for, for, for family homes. You can split them up into eight. I agree with you. Can, you. I agree you can do you. what you can do, but I would ban service accommodation. Yeah. I, 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 actually, the way to ban it is I would put it into a planning class, Rupert, its own yeah. planning class. And I would yeah. say, if you need to use that, if you want to use that for service accommodation, then you have to apply for planning like everybody else. And then the, the, the planning committee in the local area could assess it, assess it properly. You know, mm. I've, I've just, you know, in our town, someone's just done a, a, a client of ours done a great refurb on, on a property. And, um, and one of the healthcare providers has taken it on for officers. Mm. The, that, the, the actual, they applied for planning and planning, regardless of the fact that there's empty offices all around the town, let them move into this residential property and gave them planning to use it as offices. Oh. Incredible. I would, you know, I would stop it. I would ban it. Family home, uh, homes are to be used for a residential purpose. And I oh. think, Carry on. Carry and on. I think, and, and my, my fear is, is that like anything else that the government does, you know, the pendulum swings all the way to the left and then swings all the way to the right. They never seem to find a middle road. And with housing, my greatest fear is that at some point in time, a Labour government gets in and they have to act on the subject of housing. And, and, and they will do all kinds of things radical that would not be beneficial to you or I, mm -hmm. uh, you know. I think they will bring in right to buy and things like that from a landlord. If you've been renting from your private landlord for so many years, then you're entitled to such and such amount of discount if you want to buy it from them. All mm. kinds of things like that. Mm. 
No, I can I can uh, imagine that, and I would imagine as well that you know over time the service accommodation thing will, you know, find its 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 level, and and hotels perhaps need to react to the demands of the service accommodation guests and maybe have suites with kitchens and in and things like that. But it does make a lot more sense that the service accommodation sector is you know on on the edge of uh, of town by the motorway you know in in a you know hotel style commercial building with a big car park there yeah. and security lights and stuff um, that it's, would it's, be it's, the most sensible it's come way. to the point where it needs legislating for doesn't it in planning yeah. law yeah or or by licensing which is probably more likely the way they'll go yeah, because the council will want yeah. the money they want the license money so they'll they'll take all the money and then slowly start revoking licenses through complaints and things like that in the meantime yeah. it will it, it will prolong the whole activity because the council will be quite happy with the licensing fees you know yeah i mean it with, with regards to the councils i mean it's it's wrong they are now judge jury and executioner they are you know yeah. I, I remember um you know our local environmental health department if they uh, managed, if they needed to get involved in anything that we were doing um, you know, they were quite happy to, and it was all great. And we used to, we used to court them and, you know, and, and we, we have a good relationship. Um, but, you know, back when 15 years ago, other people were, they had little, um, little chance of enforcing anything on you, you know, um, I, they, they, they were, they were really stressed out, didn't like the jobs at all. These very same people I meet now have got a smile from ear to ear. Because if they go across an landlord that won't tow the line, they can. They all they need is court-like evidence, and they could fine him anywhere between five and thirty thousand pounds per yeah. property per offence. That that trust me, they are loving it as a revenue raiser. Mm, yeah. No. Well, that was incredibly interesting, and thanks so much for for everything and staying on for so long. We're we're two hours in now. Um, okay. So, um, well, my, my head's spinning. Um, has anybody in the room got anything they want to bring up um, before we close? I think I've got a question about freeholds. Um, I've been I've been offered the freehold of a peppercorn rent. Should I be taking that? Should I be paying a grand for someone that only cost me a quid or two a year? Um, so there's, there's there's a number of things to think about in that. Um, one um, is there, is there, first thing, first thing that comes to mind is is um, will it take your focus away from what you already do? Okay, is it something that you know about? How much time is it going to take? Or what's what uh, and for what means have you got the chance there to um, to um, to um, I don't know I'd put extra fees in there to buy any property that it covers by the leases, you know. For it, me, it's, just, it's just the freehold on a terraced house, that's all. Yeah, I would, me personally, I wouldn't bother. You wouldn't bother? It. No, nothing in it. Mm -hmm. No. There are, there, there are people, because, and the reason for that is you've got to do it in any great volume. The people that are in it and, and get decent money from it are that buy them in great volume. Does it not add value to the property to own the freehold? Um. <laughs> and will it add how long's left on the lease? I suppose. Oh, it's a nine 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 year, so there's like eight hundred odd years left. Okay. Um. Yeah. If 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 you've got an itch to scratch, I'm a big believer in scratching it. That's the answer to the question. If you've got an itch to scratch, scratch it. <laughs> but I would. I, I would. I think it would add value. I think it yeah. would add more more value than it would cost you. Would you own the lease that the building's in already? Uh, well, yes. Yeah, you do. I've got I've got a similar situation. Well, it's I would a buy it now. It's yeah. a terrorist. Oh, it's, sorry, yeah, Richard. It's a yeah. it's a prop. It's yeah. two properties actually that I own. They're all peppercorn. Oh, no, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I'd buy it all day long. In that case, yeah. even though it's like one pound sixty a year, but they want a grand for the free old. Nah, it just doesn't nah, nah. seem sensible. No, no, no. no. I get hold of, if you've got the two terrace properties it's in, get hold of them. I, I, if something's leafed I won't buy it unless I get the freehold with it. Yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't know. Sorry, I didn't know you own the properties. Oh, so yeah, it's not a freehold portfolio investment. No, it is properties that I own. Yeah. Now you want to get hold of that? You want it? Yeah. Buy Even that. for a grand, you think yeah. it'll add more than that to the value? Yeah. 
You're yeah. being a tight you northerner, control. Chris. <laughs> yeah, you've, got, you've got control. Certainly. Right, okay. Snap the hand off if you can get it for a grand. Right, okay. Okay. And yeah. being the tight northerner, have you ever heard of the first tier court, the government adjudication yeah. for freeholds? Uh, not for, I've been to first tier tribunals for other things, but not for leasehold. But, Just um, if they might save me a bit of money by doing that. Mm. Do you know what? The time and convenience for a grand. If you've got the opportunity, just buy it. Just buy right, it. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, don't, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't bat an eyelid. I wouldn't ask quite Fine. A, uh, twice. I, I'm Fine. surprised you asked. Get it. Just buy it. Yeah. Right. I'll do that tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Great advice. Yeah. Pete, sir, have you got anything to add? Yeah. Uh, just to say that was very interesting. Thank you, Peter. I, the thing is, the thing is, after 30 years, if I don't know just about everything that there is to know, then I may as well just go and be a barber or a, a butcher <laughs> or something, and I, you know. Yeah. Well, I, I have to say, I, I feel a little bit guilty because while, while you were buying properties today, I was out on the golf course trying to improve my, you know, but uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I only work probably, I don't know, 45 minutes a day at the minute. Okay, that's good. Yeah. From home, so you know. that's it. Well, well, we've 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 more than doubled your workload for today. Then how about that? <laughs> <laughs> if any, by the way, if anybody got any other questions or they want to anything they yeah. want to ask me, just email me Richard at ipsestates.com. Fantastic. Brilliant. OK, we're going to shut it down there. And thank you so much. Um, you know, I'll send you a private message, but really appreciate that, Richard. Thank you. Yeah. Great. I've enjoyed it. Thanks for the invite. See you all. Thanks. Thank you, Rich. Bye-bye. See you soon. Ta-da. Bye-bye.